Hi everyone, welcome back. In this video we're going to be talking about the definite integral. And on the screen you have the definition for the definite integral of f of x from a to b. The definition says that if f of x is a function defined on the interval from a to b, we subdivide the interval into subintervals of equal width known as delta x and this is given by b minus a divided by n. Then we say let the a value, in other words that's the left end point of the interval, be x naught, then x1, then x2, so on and so forth, all the way till we get to x sub n, which is the rightmost endpoint of the interval. And those are going to be the endpoints of the subintervals that we're defining here. And so what you see at the bottom of your screen right now in the depiction of this graph for the function f of x from the interval from a to b is that I've subdivided the intervals into equal lengths known as delta x. And that's all these lengths known as delta x. And x naught, x1, x2, sorry, x naught, x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, x sub 4, all the way to x sub n. These are all the endpoints of the subintervals that we've subdivided here. And now what we're going to say is that we're going to take some sample point in each subinterval. And we're going to call these sub, sorry, we're going to call these sample points x sub i star. So on the first subinterval, we have an x sub 1 star. And that just means it's some sample point in that given interval. Once we get the sample point, we determine the height by observing f of x sub i star, or in this case, sub 1 star. x sub 2 star is a sample point in the second subinterval. x sub 3 is a sample point in the third subinterval. And then we also have that x sub i x sub i is a sample point in the subinterval from x sub i minus 1 to x sub i. So again, just identifying that we can take any random sample point in each subinterval. Now, the, the sample points that we take can either be left endpoints, right endpoints, they could be midpoints. Uh, they could be any point in that subinterval so long as we choose a sample point within that subinterval. Then we say that the definite integral of the function f of x from a to b is, and we're using this notation here, the integral from a to b for f of x dx is equal to the limit as n tends to infinity for the summation where the index i begins at 1, stops at n, for the function f evaluated at all of the sample points that we're choosing multiplied by delta x. f of x, f of x sub i star, this is going to determine the height of each rectangle. Delta x is the width for every single rectangle. The summation is then going to add all of those areas for those rectangles, and n is the stopping value that we're choosing, so how many ever subintervals we want. However, the limit is then going to say that we don't want to just approximate this area, we want an actual result for the area that is going to be concise. And in order to do that, we're then going to infinitely subdivide the, this interval from A to B, and that's where that limit comes into play. And again, this only works provided that the limit exists. If it does, we say that the function f of x is integrable on the interval from A to B. And here, what I have on the left side of your screen, left bottom side, I have the integral from a to b for f of x dx. And we're going to break down every piece for that integral, that way we can define what it is. The lower bound is typically known as the lower limit of integration. So when we write the integral symbol, 
the lower part of the integral will define what is that lower limit of integration. B is going to be the upper limit of integration, whatever that number is. So again, as long as we're given an interval, if the function is integrable over that interval, we can then write the integral from A to B. And again, whatever A and B values are. F of X is known as the integrand. So whenever you hear me talking about, well, what is your integrand? That means what is the function that we are integrating? So that's what we're looking at when we're looking at this integrand. The symbol, and this is a summation, it's an elongated S. S represents sum. This is what Leibniz introduced whenever he was looking at developing this integration technique. So the symbol is just this elongated S, and it's known as the integral sign. So again, we have the integral sign. So far, we have a lower limit of integration, upper limit of integration, and we have the integrand. dx. dx is the differential for the independent variable. dx is basically going to let us know what variable we are integrating with respect to. Remember, differentials came about when we started looking at derivatives. And we started developing the process to say, when we take a derivative, we always want to know what is the derivative with respect to. In other words, when we take the derivative, is it with respect to x? Is it with respect to t? Is it with respect to m? Is it with respect to theta? We always identified. In this particular instance, when we're dealing with integrals, we're dealing with the exact same thing. We got to identify what is this differential and what is it with respect to that is going to be the independent variable that we are analyzing. And when we're looking at the integral from a to b for f of x dx, at the end of the day, x being an independent variable is the way that we're labeling it. Could we have labeled our function to be g of t? Sure we could. Our integrand could be g of t, but if it's g of t, then the variable needs to be, um, needs to be shown here in this differential. So if we have g of t, then we must integrate with respect to dt. Also, the bounds of integration, again, don't have to be from a to b. They could be from any numbers that we choose, whether it be a to b or c to d. All of these values are going to be exactly the same. Again, we can use an integrand that says h of r h is the function, r is the variable, which means dr is going to be this differential that we're going to use for integration. We could also have f of theta. This is going to be d theta. And if theta is changing, then it's going to change from one angle to another, from alpha to beta. And this integral that we've developed here with this definition that we can then analyze, this integral is going to be the net area for the area underneath the function f of x and bounded by the interval from a to b. So again, it's the net area that we're observing. And that's going to be an important, uh, an important concept to remember. Now, at the bottom of your screen, you're also going to have two different theorems. The first theorem says that if f ha is continuous on the interval from a to b, or if f has only a finite number of jump discontinuities, then the function f is going to be integrable on the interval from a to b. All right, this is going to be great because, again, this says that if your function has jump discontinuities, and remember, we can use limits to determine where the jump discontinuities are, if our function has a finite number of jump discontinuities, then the function is still integrable, meaning we can still integrate on that interval from A to B. We just have to figure out where are those jump discontinuities. That way we can go through and we can integrate. The second theorem says if F is integrable on the interval from A to B, then the integral from a to b for f of x dx 
is going to be equal to the Riemann sum definition. And the Riemann sum definition is this definition that we got right up here. So this says that that definite integral is equal to the limit as n tends to infinity for the summation of the function f of x sub i multiplied by delta x, where i begins at 1 and n and stops at n. And once again, this is where delta x is known as b minus a divided by n, and your x sub i is defined as a plus i delta x. So this is an important theorem that we need to keep in our back pocket all, at all times. As we progress through the next uh, chapter 15, or sorry, chapter 4, and then on to chapter 5. My apologies, not chapter 15. So we kind of need to keep that in mind. And in order to tie that in as well with the items that we're going to be looking at, we need to identify these important summation properties. And these are the summation properties that we're going to need to know throughout this course. We need to have a mental note that any time that we see any one of these four summation properties, we must always be able to generate their results. So these properties come from algebra. Uh, back in maybe intermediate or college algebra, you should have seen uh, a section that introduced series, and this would have been within that section that introduced series. Also, you could have seen this with mathematical induction. Using mathematical induction, we're then able to prove, for example, that the summation of i beginning at 1 stopping at n for the value of i squared that this is equal to the quantity of n times n plus 1 times 2 n plus 1 all divided by 6. So mathematical induction proves that this statement works. And not only that one, it proves that all four statements are true. But for now, what we want to do is we want to work with this example. We want to evaluate the integral from 1 to 4 for the function or for the integrand x squared minus 4x plus 2 with the differential dx. And we're going to use this by using the limit definition of an integral. So the limit definition of an integral, let's go with that limit definition. So here I have the integral from 1 to 4. And this is going to be for x squared minus 4x plus 2. This is all dx. And when we're using the limit definition, in other words, the Riemann sum definition of an integral, we need to rewrite everything as the limit, but not just the limit as n tends to infinity, but for the sum of the function f of x sub i. So we need to go through and we need to identify what is my function f of x. So f of x for us is given as x squared minus 4x plus 2. Then we need to find what is f of x sub i. Well, remember, f of x sub i is defined as, and I'll actually write it on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'm going to write x sub i is given by a plus i delta x, which means we need to know what all these values are. a is the lower bound of that interval, lower limit, so that's 1. i stays as i. Delta x is b minus a over n. Well, b minus a, that's 4 minus 1 and that's going to be 3 over n. And this is what I am making the substitution into my function with. So my function for x squared, that's now going to be 1 plus 3i over n, quantity squared, minus 4 times x, but that x is now x sub i, which is 1 plus 
3i over n, and then plus 2. So this is the function that I'm making my substitution in here with. And that's exactly what I'm going to do here. Take my function f of x sub i, which is 1 plus 3i over n quantity squared minus 4 times the quantity of 1 plus 3i over n plus 2. Now all of this needs to be multiplied by delta x. And delta x, remember we said that was 3 over n. So again, remember delta x is this b minus a over n, which is 4 minus 1 over n, which was 3 over n. So again, this here is my f of x sub i. And this here was my delta x. Now, analyzing my limit, or sorry, analyzing my summation, my summation is only adding up all of the factors or all of the terms that contain an i component. Since 3 over n doesn't contain the i component that the summation is adding up together, what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor that 3 over n outside of that summation. So the limit as n tends to infinity multiplied by 3 over n, now multiplied by the summation, I beginning at 1, stopping at n, and we're going to expand these brackets. So we will now get 1 plus 6i over n plus 9i squared over n squared minus 4 minus 12i over n plus 2. So this is all of my summation. Let's combine like terms. So combining like terms, I have 1 and 2, so that's going to get me 3. I have 6i divided by n minus 12i divided by n. When I combine those like terms, we will now get negative 6i divided by n. Oops, sorry, I had a 4 there as well. 1 minus 4 plus 2, that's going to be minus 1. My apologies there. So minus 1 minus 6i over n plus 9i squared over n squared. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the summation of all the individual components now that I just have addition and subtraction between those terms. So what we get here is that the summation of i beginning at 1, stopping at n for negative 1, we're then going to subtract 6 over n multiplied by the summation of i beginning at 1, stopping at i, or sorry, uh, for i, plus 9 over n squared multiplied by the summation i beginning at 1, stopping at n, and this is for i squared. So again, because the summation was being taken for these three terms, the summation could be taken for each individual term. And now that we see the summation for each individual term, we're then going to be able to say, well, those summations are part of the summation properties. We see here that the summation of i beginning at 1, stopping at n for i, this should be the summation property that we were given right up top of your screen. Summation for i beginning at 1, stopping at n for i squared. Again, that's another formula at the top of your screen. 
and the summation for i beginning at one stopping at n for a constant value, in this case negative one, is the very first one at the top of your screen on the left hand side. Which means when we take the summations, we are now left with negative one multiplied by n minus six over n multiplied by n times n plus one divided by two plus nine over n squared multiplied by that i squared formula which is n times n plus one times two n plus one all divided by six. And so now is where we can do a few things to simplify this. So I'm going to simplify here as much as I can and I'll get negative n minus this n cancels out with this n and then two goes into six three times. So we're left with three multiplied by n plus one plus one of these n's will cancel out with one of these, nine divided by six, that will reduce to three halves. So we have three halves multiplied by, we're gonna have n plus one times two n plus one, all divided by one of these n's that canceled out, like this. And so now I'm going to distribute the three N. Remember that was the Delta X that I initially factored out of the summation. But since we have no more summation notations, we can just go through and distribute. So this will now be negative three. Once we distribute here and actually I'll keep it as such. Right. Distribute once again, we get minus three times three, that's going to be nine. Cheese and crackers. Let's distribute again, three halves multiplied by, oh sorry, the three is gonna multiply by the other three, so that's nine. All right, so three times three, that was nine. And then we have n plus one divided by the initial n that we had. And then we still have a two times n plus one. This is gonna be divided by the other n that was distributing for that denominator. And the reason I wanna do this is going to be very, very uh, apparent in, a, in just a little bit. All right, so now I'm going to simplify as much as I can before I take this limit. So when I simplify, the first term I get negative three, the second term I'm gonna simplify, n divided by n is one, one over n is just one over n. Same thing's happening here, n over n is one, 1 over n stays as 1 over n. 2n divided by n is 2. 1 over n is just 1 over n. Now, the reason I left it, or the reason I distributed and I lined up all of my factors that contains n's with one another, uh, was the whole reason why I wanted to take this approach. Because as n goes to infinity, then 1 over n is gonna tend to zero, zero, and zero. Therefore, we're going to be left with a limit as n tends to infinity for, oh, sorry, 
Once we take the limit, we're left with negative three minus nine times one plus nine halves multiplied by one multiplied by two. This is negative three minus nine plus nine where the answer is just negative three. And what this tells me is that the net area for this function from one to four is going to be negative three. And we want to analyze that just a little bit further because we wanna see what is this letting us know when we're talking about this net area. So here's the function that we're looking at, the function f of x, which was given by x squared minus four x plus two. And here's where I took the integral for this region. Now you're gonna analyze that the area underneath the curve is represented by two different areas. One area is above the x-axis while one area is below the x-axis. Anytime that the area goes below the x-axis, because it's going below the x-axis, the y values are gonna be negative and the integral doesn't know how to differentiate between negative and positive area. So to the integral, it's just like if we're adding some negative values here for this area located below the x-axis, and we're adding some positive values that's located above the x-axis. Now, naturally, since we have more negative area than more positive area, then the integral or the result will then be negative. And again, this is because the integral only calculates net area, meaning that it cannot discern between negative and positive values as it goes below and above the x-axis. So it's possible that your integral, when you evaluate it, can be zero, and that just means that the area essentially canceled out because you have the same amount above the x-axis as you do below the x-axis with respect to the function that you're observing. And so that's what we wanna keep in mind, that the integral calculates net area. And we are gonna go through some examples where we're gonna be able to counteract that. But in order to do that, we then must interpret where our function goes below the x-axis. So let's go back to our notes and we'll complete that there. All right, perfect. And so now that we got to see that net area, what we're gonna do is we're gonna really quickly talk about the midpoint rule before we carry on with some of these integration properties. So the midpoint rule says that we can approximate the area underneath the integral from a to b for f of x dx by using a midpoint approximation. This is different from left endpoint, right endpoint, upper sum, and lower sum approximations. This one's gonna be a new type that we call the midpoint. And what we do with the midpoint is we use the notation x bar sub i. If you've taken statistics, you've seen that x bar typically refers to a mean or an average. And that's exactly what we're doing here is that we're gonna be looking at the average in that subinterval, and that is itself going to be the midpoint of that subinterval. And so every value that we get, or in this case, every midpoint that we get for this subinterval, this is going to create our rectangles in which we will find the area. So again, the midpoint will create our rectangles. So this here is going to be x sub one bar. This next one is going to be x sub two bar. The next midpoint will be x bar sub three.
the next one is x bar sub 4. And then the next one is x bar sub 5. And what we're focused on here is to find these midpoints. And again, notice it looks like it's giving us a better approximation than some left endpoint and some right endpoint for this particular function. And it's not to say that one method is better than the other. It just it's going to depend on what function we're looking at and what type of approximation we want to use. Nonetheless, we can always, always, always use midpoint approximations if we choose. So this is going to be the midpoint approximation. And what we want to do then is we want to work on an example that will help us illustrate this more algebraically. So the example is going to be to use the midpoint rule to approximate or to yeah to approximate the integral from 0 to 1 for x cubed plus 1 dx with n is equal to 5 and so what I want to do really quickly then is I want to start on the interval from 0 to 1 and I want to start my subdivisions. So in order to start this off, I'm going to start off with delta x. We know we're going to need delta x because we're going to be dealing with the sub or sorry with the integral with this interval from 0 to 1. So we go 1 minus 0, that's b minus a, divided by n, which is 5. This is now going to be 1 fifth. So we got delta x. Now what we want to do is we want to identify our subintervals. Well, in order to get the endpoints x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, x sub 4, we needed this delta x. So what I'm going to do now is we can identify every value, every x sub i value, as the a value, the a value being 0, plus i delta x or delta x is one fifth. So if we want x sub one, x sub one is just going to be i is one, so that's one fifth. x sub two, i is two, which means two fifths. x sub three, i is three, which means three fifths. And we can keep going. Now, I typically like to view this just on a number line, on the x-axis number line, just so that I can get a visualization of what's taking place here. So if I start at 0, and let's actually make this a little bit larger. So I'm going to go from 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, so here's my first one, one fifth. All right, so again, I went delta x and I got this one fifth. My next one is two fifths because again, I increment delta x. My next one is three fifths. Four fifths, and then five fifths, which is just one. And we can double check, make sure we have these five sub intervals. 
So we have the first interval from 0 to 1 fifth, second interval from 1 fifth to 2 fifths, third interval from 2 fifths to 3 fifths, fourth interval from 4 fifths, sorry, from 3 fifths to 4 fifths, fifth interval from 4 fifths to 1. So we got all the values that we need, all the subintervals that we wanted. And that's what this x sub i, or in other words, x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, was actually defining here. So we got all of our delta x's. Now we need to identify what is the midpoint for all of these subintervals. And in order to do that, we need to take the two endpoints of each subinterval, add them together, and then divide by 2. So I'm going to take 0 plus 1 fifth, and I'm going to divide it by 2. You'll see that this gets me 1 tenth, which means this is my midpoint. So this here is x bar sub 1, which is 1 tenth. I'm going to do my next midpoint. The next midpoint is going to be 1 fifth plus 2 fifths divided by 2. This will get me 3 fifths over 2, which will reduce then to 3 tenths. and this is my x sub 2, x bar sub 2. Third midpoint, once again, I'm going to add the two together, the two endpoints, 2 fifths plus 3 fifths, divided by 2, 2 fifths plus 3 fifths, this is going to get you 5 fifths, which is just going to be 1, so this is going to be 1 half. Alright, we can keep going. The next value, if you notice, there's a pattern here. One tenth, three tenths, the next one would have been five tenths, this one's going to be six tenths. So six tenths, and then we can go through and we can jump over. So this is going to be, oh, sorry, not six. Uh, that was, it's incrementing by twos. So that was three. 4, 5, this one's going to be 7 tenths, and this one's going to be 9 tenths. There we are. And so these are all of our midpoints, and these are the midpoints that I want to focus on when I want this approximation. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the integral from 0 to 1 for x cubed plus 1 dx, this is going to be approximated by using the midpoints, and the midpoint sum is going to be the summation of i beginning at 1, stopping at n, for all of the midpoints that we're observing, x bar sub i multiplied by delta x. This means that delta x is going to multiply all the summation for all of the midpoints evaluated at the respective function. So this is going to be function evaluated at midpoint 1 plus the function evaluated at midpoint 2 plus the function evaluated at midpoint 3 plus the function evaluated at midpoint 4 plus the function evaluated at midpoint 5. Delta x, we know what delta x is, that's one fifth. The function at the first midpoint, so my function is square root of x cubed plus one, and so we're gonna evaluate that at one tenth. So we're gonna have the cube root of one tenth to the power of three plus one. The second midpoint, evaluated on the function, 3 tenths cubed plus 1. Next midpoint, 5 tenths, or in this case 1 half cubed plus 1, square root of that, plus 7 tenths cubed plus 1, plus 
9 tenths cubed plus 1. And this is going to be the values that we need to then identify here. And so in order to identify this or to work with this, I'm going to go through and I'm going to start making these insertions into my calculator as much as I can. Once I get this, I'm then able to approximate that this sum, because we're dealing with the square root of some cube roots, or sorry, the square of some cubes, we're not going to be able to extract an exact answer. Or if we do, it's going to look very, very messy and very elongated. In this particular case, I want to approximate this because again, I was asked to approximate, use the midpoint rule to approximate this. So that approximation is going to be 1.1097. 1 and that's going to be the approximation here. And again, we didn't need to see the graph. All we needed to know is what is delta x, what are your endpoints, and then finally use the endpoints to find the midpoints and evaluate the function given those midpoints. Awesome. Now let's go into the properties of integrals. That way we can definitely see and we can definitely start working with the analyzing of those integrals. All right, so here we have the properties of integrals. And the first two properties of the integrals, uh, here we're rolling number one and number two. Properties number one and property number two into one property here where we have the integral from a to b for the function f of x dx plus or minus the integral from a to b for g of x dx. Now, because they both have the exact same variable that they're integrating, which means it's a dx, and both of these integrals have the same limit of integration bounds, the integral from a to b, then what we can do is we can combine these two integrals into a singular integral where we're either adding or subtracting the functions that were initially in the integrands. And so again, this is property number one and property number two. Number one is where we have the addition. Number two is where we have the subtraction. Property number three deals with a constant being multiplied by a function. The constant being multiplied by the function, because the integral is a summation, when we add repeatedly and we have the same factor in all of the terms, in this case c, then that means that we can factor out that specific term and therefore we're gonna have c times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Property number four says that if we take the integral from a to b for f of x dx, this will be the same integral except the value will be negative because this time we're going to be integrating from b to a. And remember, we always want the interval from a to b. That's because we're going from the smallest number to the largest number. If we switch the bounds of integration, then that means that we are now integrating from right to left, which will produce a negative number because, again, the integral does not discern between what is positive and what is negative. It just computes a calculation. Number five, the integral from a to a for f of x dx. This pretty much says that if we're integrating from the exact same bound, then the rectangles that we're taking for this Riemann sum don't have a width because delta x will then be zero. A minus a or, or b minus a over n for delta x, in this case would be a minus a over n, where that would be zero, hence the whole integral turns out to be zero. And again, this only happens for continuous functions. And that's exactly what these integrals are, is these are continuous functions that we're integrating over. For the last three properties, property number six, property number seven, and property number eight, we have different results here. Ultimately, these results for number six and number seven are going to be pretty much the same. 
the, the one result for number six says that if you have a function bigger than another function, so in this case f of x greater than g of x, then when we take the integral of both functions, the integral for f of x dx should still be greater than or equal to the integral of g of x dx. Same thing's gonna hold if f of x is greater than zero for all x in that given interval. When we take the integral, that summation or that evaluation will still be greater than or equal to zero. The very last one, the very last one says that if we can bound our function between two bounds, lowercase m and uppercase m. So again, all we wanna do is take the function f of x and bound it. Find some minimum value that will bound it from below. Find some maximum value that will bound it from above. If we can do that on a given interval, then when we take the integral of the function, the integral of the function with respect to dx will be bounded below by m, that lower bound, multiplied by the length of the interval that the function is being integrated on. The upper bound will be given by the upper limit for the function f of x multiplied by the length of the interval b minus a. And to get us a little bit more acquainted with the last property, property number eight, we're gonna use this example here that says, use the last integral property, and again, that's referencing property number eight, to estimate the value of the integral from zero to two for the function x cubed minus three x plus three dx. And so again, in order to do this, what we're gonna do is we're first gonna identify what is our function f of x. f of x is given as x cubed minus three x plus three. Now again, we need to find some bounds for this on the interval. So again, the interval is from zero to two. So we need to find some bounds here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna rely on our methods that we've learned in chapter three to find minimums and maximums of a function on a given interval. This is known as your extreme value theorem. The extreme value theorem guarantees that we have an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum on a given interval, so long as we check the endpoints and so long as we check the critical numbers. The endpoints we can evaluate into the function, very straightforward. However, we need to find the critical numbers. So to find the critical numbers, we take the derivative. The derivative for the function f of x, this is going to be three x squared minus three. In order to find the critical number, we're gonna set this equal to zero. Apologize for that. We're gonna get three times x squared minus one is equal to zero, which ultimately gets us that x is equal to positive or negative one. Now, one of those values cannot be true because we're given an interval. So x cannot be equal to negative one. X cannot be equal to negative one because it's not in the interval that we're given. However, x is equal to one is in that interval. So now we have to check those values. We're gonna check the endpoints, critical numbers, and here we go. F of zero, we're going to get three. F of one, we get one. F of two, this is going to be eight minus six, that's going to be two plus three, that's five which means we're guaranteed an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum in this given interval. And the maximum is gonna occur at the x value of two. The minimum is gonna occur at the x value of one. So by the extreme value theorem, f of x has 
an absolute maximum of five when x is equal to two and an absolute minimum of one when x is equal to one. Now again, this isn't the answer, but the whole reason that we were doing this for is so that we can extract what are the bounds for the function f of x on the given interval. So that's where we start. We start with the bounds that were given to us or that we found and those bounds is going to be five and one. So we now get that f of x is bounded between the absolute minimum and the absolute maximum only when the values are between x is equal to zero and x is equal to two. So there we are, we found the bounds for f of x, what's the minimum, what's the maximum. Now, when we take the integral, well, taking the integral here of both sides, we're now gonna have to integrate with respect to dx, or we're now gonna have to integrate through this function. All right, so what we're gonna do at this point in time is we're gonna start identifying that if I wanna take the integral from zero to two, remember f of x is this function, which was x cubed minus three x plus three, dx, we're going to take 1 and we're going to multiply by b minus a. b minus a is 2 minus 0. We're going to take 5, that upper bound, and we're going to multiply by the length of the interval, 2 minus 0, which means the lower bound for the integral approximation now becomes 2. And the upper bound now becomes 10. Therefore, the estimate value of the integral will be lying between the value of 2 and 10. And that's all that we can do at this point in time. All right, so what I wanna do is I wanna start illustrating what does this mean? All right, and to illustrate that, I'm gonna bring in a picture of the graph, that way we can analyze it a little bit further. All right, so here's the function that we're working with. Here's f of x. And what we did with f of x is we found the minimum, the absolute minimum. So here's the absolute minimum on the given interval from zero to two. All right, so this function goes from zero to two. So it's only this little arc right here. Absolute minimum is happening here at one, one. Absolute maximum is happening all the way up here at the x coordinate of two comma five. And that's what we stated by the extreme value theorem. Now, when we're integrating, you're gonna see that the area underneath the curve is integrated here. And that's what we get when we're doing the integral. However, when we're doing the approximation, we're then saying that if we take this height of this lower bound, then what we're doing is we get an area here, and that area corresponds to the area of a rectangle, which is the area from zero to two with a height of f of x, f of x being the absolute minimum. So this is going to be the distance of two times one, and that's what we had here for the lower bound, two times one. The upper bound, also creates an area. This area, however, is much larger. As such. 
And this area corresponds with a width of 5, or a height of 5, and a width of 2. So look at this down here, down below. The rectangle has a distance of 0 to 2, therefore distance of 2, and a height of the absolute maximum on that interval for the function, therefore the height is 5. 5 times 2 gets us the area of this rectangle. Therefore, the area of that integral that's being integrated from 0 to 2 is definitely going to be bounded between this larger rectangular piece and this smaller rectangular piece. And therefore, we can create those bounds. So that's definitely something to keep in mind, and it gives you more of a visual for this particular instance when we have this type of problem. Now, let's look at a different type of problem before we carry on. Here, we're going to evaluate I'm just going to say evaluate the integral from negative 5 to 5 for the quantity of x minus square root of 25 minus x squared dx. And this is going to be by using areas. So again, we don't want to go through the whole evaluation process, at least the whole evaluation process using techniques of integration. We understand that the integral is just the area under the curve for the given interval along the given function. And we're going to keep using that concept. So in order to evaluate this, this seems pretty, pretty tough to evaluate even if you were using the limit definition. And in order to be able to evaluate this more algebraically, you're going to need to go into Calc 2 to develop more techniques of integration there. For now, we have the integral from negative 5 to 5 for x minus the square root of 25 minus x squared dx. Again, negative 5 to 5 for the quantity of x dx. And what I'm using here is I'm using property number 2 for integrals to say that if I have the addition or subtraction of two different functions, then I can split those two functions into their independent integrals. And this is going to be for the square root of 25 minus x squared dx. So as I'm trying to evaluate this, I'm going to go through and I'm going to start looking at these areas. And so to look at these areas, I'm going to need to find out what are the different functions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the first function, the function right in here for the first integral, meaning the integrand of x. I'm just going to call that f of x. So this function x is being integrated from negative 5 to 5. So that's going to be for all the x values bounded between negative 5 and 5. So now what I get to do is I need to analyze this function on this given interval. All right, and again, I'm going to just analyze it using areas. So in order to do this, I need a grid. And that's exactly what I'm going to start on here. All right, I'll make sure I draw it, and when I come back really quickly, it will have the grid. All right, so here's the grid that we have, and now we're going to go ahead and we're going to graph the function x for the interval from negative 5 to 5. There we are. So this is the function x. So here's f of x graphed from x is equal to negative 5 to x is equal to 5. Now, 
the area underneath the curve is then going to be represented here in this area and it's also going to be represented in this area here. Now since f of x you're going to notice that the area underneath one triangular region is the exact same as the area in the other triangular region. This is going to imply that when I look at my area from 0 to 5 for the function f of x, this is going to have a positive value for whatever area this is. The integral from negative 5 to 0 is going to have a negative area. But if they're the same area, the positive and the negative value will then cancel. Therefore, we're going to be left with the integral from negative 5 to 5 for x dx will be equal to 0. Because again, we have an equal amount of area above the x-axis and below f of x and below the x-axis but above f of x. Exact same area, therefore they cancel out. On to the next function. We have the integral from negative 5 to 5 for this function. I'm going to call this function g of x. So g of x is going to be equal to 25 minus x squared. Well, another name for g of x is just y. So therefore, we're looking at y is equal to the square root of 25 minus x squared. If we square both sides, we're looking at y squared is equal to 25 minus x squared. But we got to be careful here. We have a restriction. The initial restriction for g of f, sorry, for g of x, the initial restriction for g of x was that it needs to be bounded between negative 5 and 5. And now we have a new restriction here moving from where we squared both the left and the right side for y is equal to the square root of 25 minus x squared, we now have a new restriction for the function or the value of y squared minus 25 minus x squared. This only works whenever y is greater than or equal to zero. And this is because we're dealing with a square root. y being equal to a square root will only imply that the y component will be at the very smallest a zero, at the very largest some random large positive number. Then we're going to add x squared to both sides and now we get x squared plus y squared is equal to 25. This is the equation of a circle. More importantly it's the equation of a circle centered at 0, 0 with a radius of 5. And that's what we want to use here when we're talking about the x squared plus y squared is equal to 25. So we're going to depict that really quick. Alright, so here we are. And I'm going to graph x squared plus y squared is equal to 25 with the restrictions that I'm given. The restrictions that I'm given says that x values go between negative 5 and 5. So the x values go between negative 5 and 5, but I'm only graphing this circle for the restriction where y is greater than or equal to 0, meaning the positive y-axis. In this instance, we're only looking at the top semicircle. But one more try. One more try. Okay, not bad. And so the area that we're then analyzing here is this area for this semicircle. 
Now, the area for this type of semicircle is just based off of the area for a circle. So the area of a circle is just pi r squared, which means the area in here, or the area for this semicircle, I'm going to abbreviate this as area for SC, which means semicircle, is going to be one half, because we're going to cut the area in half, by pi r squared. So again, pi r squared is the area for a whole circle. Half of it is just taking half. But now the radius that we're given here is 5, which means this is 1 half pi multiplied by 5 squared, which means this is 25 pi divided by 2. Therefore, the area from negative 5 to 5 for the integral of the square root of 25 minus x squared dx is going to be equal to 25 pi over 2. And therefore, we now have enough information to finish answering the question. So the question said that we needed to evaluate this integral, and that's exactly what we did. We decomposed the integral into two different functions being subtracted from one another, and then we interpreted those functions geometrically. Therefore, the very first integral produces a value of 0. The last integral produces a value of 25 pi over 2. Therefore, the answer to this integral is negative 25 pi divided by 2. There's your answer. So it's very possible to interpret these functions that we're integrating as areas. And as soon as we interpret them as areas, we can use our knowledge from geometric figures to analyze and to extract what is the integral for that given function over this given interval. So I hope that you all enjoyed this lesson, and I will see you all back for the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, where we're going to start tying into our knowledge for summations and our knowledge for areas underneath curves, and we're going to start creating this fundamental theorem that is going to help evaluate these integrals at a much faster rate.